joining the show tonight. This man truly needs no introduction. I'll give him one anyways. You should know him as uh, the co-host of the In the Huddle podcast covering all things D3 football, of which he's been on site almost every weekend covering games this season. Commendable. Seriously. Uh, it's the man himself, Frank Rossi. What's going on? Listen, you had JB on, uh, you know, long ago and far away. I, I had to join the fun. He told me how much fun this was, and I could use some fun around this time of year because we don't have enough fun doing shows about playoffs and bowls and everything else. So, you know, it's time for some D1 rejects. I, I'm thrilled. Let's get it on here. I appreciate that, man. And I guess that's a good uh, segue for me, giving you guys the kudos of the work that you guys put into and trying to – uh, one, figure out the actual math that goes behind the playoff selections, but also um, how transparent you guys are and, and all the information that you provide to the landscape is something that I do not do. Um, and that's just kind of partially out of necessity of me trying to learn and also out of choice in that um, I just – it's not something I've ever really focused on, but I think it's it's a necessity for people who really enjoy and are passionate about the landscape like you guys are. So I want to say thank you for providing that service because that I know is something that um, I don't really get into too much on this show, and I think that's it's good that there are places that kind of have different perspectives on all this stuff. We're going to talk all about it uh, tonight, but before we get into that, I had mentioned, man, it feels like every weekend you're on site for another set of incredible games. Talk about some of those trips you've made throughout the course of this year, starting off with this last weekend, man, the Mont on Bell. That had to have been, it looked incredible, that environment. That's going to be a bucket list one for me. It, it was. And I mean, just the fact that the Cardin Auxiliary stands for this game, uh, at least the PAW did, and you could barely see the scoreboard because this is not the natural, you know, atmosphere for the scoreboard, basically be almost wrapped into these stands. And just to see those stands fill up and, uh, I was on both sidelines, but you know, I try to go where the sunlight isn't, uh, you know, directly in my face because of uh, what it does to camera quality and all that stuff. But the way the sun went that day, I was on both sidelines, and it was just, you know, the teams. It, it's intense. It really is intense. The fans, the student bases that are there, intense. Uh, so some not so Christian like out in the, yep, uh, the middle yep. of Indiana. Um, it, it caught Shocking. some moments there. I was like, okay, uh, they probably not something to report on directly here, but uh, I, I will say they get a little carried away into the game. And uh, it is, uh, you know, I, look, I, I went to Union College. I covered the Dutchman Shoes regularly. I've done Secretary's Cup. That is intense and insane, too, mm -hmm. in its own way. Uh, but Mona Bell has its own, uh, let's say, je ne sais quoi or pas or whatever the hell it, yeah. they, they say. Uh, but it, it, it's something else. You, you, you need to go and experience it yourself to fully understand it. And, uh, you know, you, to go to Whitewater Oshkosh this year, that was insane to break the uh, on-campus record there. Mm -hmm. But this is just a whole different realm. And I can't put into words well, but when they – Went over to the bell and lifted that heavy ass bell, basically at that yeah. point, uh, to you know bring it wherever they were going to finally bring it, uh, and just trying to get to interviews on the field because the crowd streamed into the field even though they were asked not to. It was it was <laughs> because that always works, yeah, of course, and uh, that rivalry's got reach, man. I mean, you guys. Uh, just the other night, you have the head coach from River Falls on the show, and he's talking about his time there and how that just uh, – there's nothing that matches it. Nothing at this level, in his opinion, of course. And uh, and that's just an incredible deal. But before we get into the actual playoff bracket, so to speak, I want to touch on some of the bowl games. And I think that's a really neat area of this level of football that has grown – at an alarming rate in a good way. Like really these last couple of years, this has just exploded into something that has afforded so many teams, some extra postseason play and an extra game. And you guys had a great deal. You announced the pairings for the ECAC bowl uh, games live. Talk about that experience. And again, this idea outside of postseason play for these D three squads, that, that area that continues to grow. Yeah. Uh, since before COVID uh, we have had the uh, real fortune of uh, getting to name the ECAC bowl games live and the ECAC has been doing this for a number of years, as uh, JB had said on our show on Monday. Uh, essentially, you know, all these other bowls that are out there, it, it, the ECAC was laughed at for a certain period of time for doing mm -hmm. these games. And suddenly we've seen a groundswell of new bowl games because people begin to realize, you know, teams like Cortland used to play in these bowls. And there's yep. no doubt about it. Grove City 
has gotten to where they are by using that extra game, that extra week of practice to their benefit to become better to who they are now, you know, household name in Division Three essentially. And these ECAC bowl games, that's how we even got introduced to Grove City. So uh, it's a special moment to be able to tell even teams that are five and five and six and four, you get one more game. And we uh, had a live shot with uh, SUNY Morrisville for the Mustangs versus the Mustangs. That's going to be happening. Yes, of course. And that, that was uh, intense and insane there but, uh, with Morrisville's uh, players we had a slight delay so we got to get the full moment from them they're they're silent silent and then they uh, <laughs> see it on the screen and it's a pandemonium uh in the student center uh, where they were so uh it was it's just a great experience those are the moments we do it for the first time we did it when Grove City showed uh their emotion uh, we found it on Twitter later on we didn't even think to do live feeds like that yeah uh, we saw it on Twitter. We're like, oh, my God, we're affecting these teams in this way with kind of the surprise moment and everything. Yeah. And uh, ever since then, we've tried to introduce that element of surprise uh, into it. And it's worked really well for us. But then all these other bowls, it's great. It is truly great to see that extra postseason ability for these guys. And that kind of puts me on like two separate tangents just off like that was great from what you said there. The first part of that is that. For all these people that say, you know, what does an extra bowl game mean? You're not playing for the playoffs. There's these people out there that think that it's just another game, especially the D3 level. I, I would ask them to go watch those reactions, right, of the guys that are actually playing and participating in these games that get another week to be around this this group of guys that, uh, let's face it, will probably never be in the same room together over the course of history and uh, be with that coaching staff of guys that hopefully they really enjoy being around. And then the second tangent that it takes me on is talking about that surprise factor and something that maybe has been eliminated at this level when it comes to a lot of the postseason implications and the bracketology. And I, I think that's one of the most pure forms of the, the postseason spirit are the teams, those at-large teams, who now we've got a few more and we'll talk about it, but, man, those coveted at-large bids for those teams that didn't know maybe that if they were on the cusp or not, and now it's we're kind of at a point where it's it's pretty cut and dry, and the news is delivered in a very a very different way. How do you see that's kind of evolved over the last couple of years, and is it is it as much of a deal as maybe I make it out to be? No, it is, because I went, uh, look, we used to do the committee chair interview on our show uh, every Sunday night of, uh, you know, Selection Sunday. Yeah. But we would pre-record it the last several years uh, in the earlier afternoon. And that means that we would get a glimpse of the brackets. And last year, I knew that Union got an at-large bid, which they weren't guaranteed. So uh, living 25 minutes from Schenectady, where Union is, I drove over there, he snuck around, and basically was ready to catch their reaction at that point. And That's there's cool. nothing like that reaction. Yeah, it's, cool. it's just, it's crazy. Uh, this year, you know, I basically lucked into the timing of when I refreshed the page on the yep. uh, NC stats page to see the, them post the final, you know, rankings from the NPI for division three football and you know quickly counted to 12 figured out if indeed what the data cast suggested was true and they were off I, I think maybe a couple hundredths of anything so it maybe someday that will make a difference i don't know but mm -hmm. uh you know it was still there but to say we have an official list of uh who's in here they are here's your top eight that's been viewed over two hundred forty thousand times uh or at least uh, the impressions are up there and it I, I think it reached peak status when charlie baker the president of the ncaa retweeted it today um, there you go i didn't know that yeah i saw i saw charlie baker in my feed i'm like thanks is this a fake account what is this <laughs> well, it was president charlie baker i got the uh, good fortune of interviewing uh on the stag bowl sideline last yep. year uh but uh, you know that that's a great moment but i would honestly take the surprise factor over a tweet going out for 240,000 times because I think it's more important sometimes to have that feeling to to make you feel like you know you had a great season here's a chance here's a chance instead of Frank Rossi who the hell is he and I hate that anyway <laughs> a lot of people say just you know poking that surprise at you on Twitter I I feel bad that on a Saturday night that some of these teams were celebrating big wins on senior days and stuff like that here I am, the uh, Grim Reaper of yeah. football, telling you, yeah, sorry, it didn't make it. The Grinch that stole the playoffs. Coaches, yeah, coaches come out on Sunday to have to tell us their feelings about it. 
it, it felt a little morbid at times, but we also felt a duty. As you yeah. said, we want to be transparent. We felt a duty to talk about what went wrong here uh, with certain things, what needs to be fixed, and put it into the coach's own words out of their own mouths as well that uh, both benefited and got screwed by the whole thing. No, I think those are good points. And yeah, there's, there is a duty there to document and to provide coverage, right? And it's like, you know, what would you be if you saw that and then just tried to ignore it? I mean, I'm sure, um, I can't say exactly, but from your perspective, that would be like, I don't even know what, trying to hold on to a grenade when the pin is pulled. Like having that information at your hands and just like sitting on that would be, a, that would be a tough one. I mean, that's, that's tough, but we'll move forward. And I wanted to, the other uh, bull series I wanted to mention, the Open Doors Bull Series is one that I've uh, just started to learn about these last couple of weeks a little bit. And I'm obviously late to the party on that one. But talk to me about this. You've got some of the highest ranked teams that obviously don't make uh, the 40 team tournament out of four different conferences. And, and this year's matchups certainly feature uh, some solid squads. We play, we've seen play some meaningful football this year. Talk to me about what you know about the uh, Open Door Series. Well, it, it, what I know about it is it's uh, besides the Cousin Subs Bowl and the uh, the the Isthmus um, Bowl, yep. um, the Culver's Isthmus Bowl, uh, you know, the Midwest Bowls were lacking. And this bowl series uh, tries to get into the Midwest more. Obviously, the pack is more Pennsylvania conference. Yes. Uh, but it, it, it's at least giving opportunities to these conferences out there that just haven't had the bowl opportunities. And, uh, you know, a Wabash, what would Wabash have known about playing in, you know, a, a bowl game? Exactly. But, you know, they have that opportunity now. And uh, it's really good schools uh, across the board. Uh, taking the pack uh, obviously takes a little bit of the uh, possibilities out of the ECAC Bowl. So now we're spreading a little thin on uh, how we're working some of these bowl situations. But, you know, long story short, this Open Door Series is exciting because it is matching up conferences that don't have a plethora, uh, some of these, of out-of-conference games they can play. The pack had none. Uh, yeah. OAC has one, for instance, and uh, giving them that opportunity in reality. So that, that's why I like what I see from something like that out there. 100%. And that PAC conference is one that um, I don't think Jimmy and I have given enough credit over the last uh, season here. That conference has been all over the place. And a couple of those teams we'll talk about in just a second that made it into the playoffs, Carnegie clinching the, the conference title. But you talked about Grove City earlier on, and you got a squad, a couple more squads there that have been making uh, a lot of noise. So let's get into the playoffs. First year now with an expanded field, 40 teams, 28 conference winners, then the 12 at large is obviously an increase from years past which feels like maybe a step in the right direction, uh, depending on who you ask. And, uh, you know, when you talk about this, the biggest changes, I think the obvious one for me, at least from an outside perspective looking in, is that pseudo play-in round. Would you kind of agree with that in that regard? Yeah. It, it, unfortunately, the way it got characterized and the way it got played out, unfortunately, were two different things. Because yep. It was supposed to be basically 7 and 8 against the uh, 2 seed and 9 and 10, the winner of that, <clears throat> against the 1 seed. Or so We were calling it 7A, 7B uh, versus the 2, and 8A, 8B versus the 1. And we saw mishmashes all over the place, again, because of geography. Yep. So you end up some, with some real anomalies. And we were hoping that they would stay true to the idea that the top 24 teams would get buys. Mm -hmm. We've got a team as uh, good as 21 that is going to be playing that opening round, that first round game. That'd be Endicott, correct? That would be Endicott. And center in the 30s yeah. gets the buy. And so... Uh, it, it didn't play out the way we were hoping. Uh, some of it avoidable, some not always avoidable if they're willing to put money into flights, but you know how that works. Of course. And so uh, it is what it is, I guess, but yeah, we will still flag and let the NCAA know you screwed over a couple teams in this process of doing this. I hear you. And you had mentioned on your show when I was listening and the idea of – doing the bracket, but after playing these quote-unquote playing games, right, of making these teams uh, go out and find the results and then putting that into this overall seating and kind of going with a more quote-unquote traditional tournament from there on out. What makes that uh, kind of a, an appealing idea from your perspective? For me, uh, you would avoid the necessity of Mount Union versus John Carroll in round two again. Yep. Uh, Mary Harden Baylor, Harden Simmons in round two again uh or even endicott uh courtland in round two which is a rematch from last year's yeah. you know, early round game first round for courtland and endicott last year uh type of thing 
it, it would allow for some better creativity because you would have the known locations ultimately. So you could actually do the geography for the 500 miles a little bit easier in that situation. I, I, I know nobody else does that anymore. I know that's not the way they work brackets uh, per se, but in a situation like this where you only have eight of these play-in games, uh, more or less, you know, this closest thing we have to it is the 68 team Division One basketball tournament, but they yeah. can afford to fly these teams wherever they want because it's Division One. We don't have that ability, so we have these, as they use in a wrestling term, and Logan Hansen used it today, the pigtails, basically, uh, kind of uh, branching out there. And if you're not going to be able to utilize these pigtails well, then maybe there's a different approach you can use to still have 40 teams qualify, still call it the playoffs, but then form the base bracket later on. It, it, I'm not thrilled with the suggestion I'm making myself, but I also see the potential need for it to avoid some of these weird anomalies that it seems like we're repeating past errors that we thought we had rectified in the first place, like these conference rematches. Yeah, I think you kind of hit it on the head earlier, too, with the conceptually versus the execution of maybe how this was actually rolled out, where, you know, in theory, some of this may have made sense. And now, um, given the geographical struggles or the financial struggles, some of those things, there's these obstacles that uh, interfere with that concept and the actual execution and the rollout of maybe some of the some of the ideas hitting there. And uh, I think some major takeaways from this uh, that I've seen from the Twitter X universe the biggest one that I of all over my timeline, at least, Cortland and North Central, their latest meeting being in the quarterfinals is one that has been very tough to stomach for a lot of people. And if you watched last year's championship game, I cannot blame them at all. I uh, look, I, I said it a while back uh, when you know I was fearful this type of thing might happen. I wanted to try to flag it to the committee. I think they uh, got my flag about the fact that Co shouldn't have been hosting against Bethel, and they did fix that this morning uh, from w what I saw after we yes, kind of went I did see that. irate about that. But, uh, you know, the idea was that, okay, the protected top eight means that they will all be ones and twos. And one, two, three, four, you know, one seats, five, six, seven, eight, two seats. What it did not say was you had to put them against the natural, you know, one versus eight, four versus five type of approach. For some reason, they felt the necessity to do that. And what it did was put number four, Cortland, against number five, North Central. Yeah. And you look at it, and you're like, you didn't have to do this. And honestly, in the old days, if both of last year's Stag Bowl uh, players or teams went 10-0 and 0 the next year, they would try to find every way to keep them on either side of the bracket. Of course. And you know, make it another stag bowl possibility. The worst case would be in the semifinals, at least get them out of the same quad quadrant mm -hmm. with each other. I don't get this. I don't get why they felt the need. JB called it lazy bracketing. And I, I, I know a lot of these guys, I interact with them all the time in terms of the coaches and ADs that are on these committees over the years. And I, I don't like to use that wording, but this was lazy bracketing. It really was because there's no rule requiring this. They could have taken that pod and moved it, you know, basically with another pod uh, and not really done much injustice to this whole thing. So this didn't need to happen. It shouldn't happen. Everybody and his brother's going to go cover the game if it does come to fruition. Yep. We got to get there first. But I mean, I, I just it sends the wrong message and this dedication to the numbers that MPI is spitting out to that degree, but then to basically just trample over the rest of the numbers when it came to the situation like Endicott uh, versus center and all that stuff. It, it, we're just picking and choosing here how we follow MPI. And yeah. I understand it's the first year of it in the first year of the 40 year, uh, 40 team situation, but th th it doesn't take rocket science to figure out that not all of this was working out correctly and could have been avoided. I hear you there. Consistency is the name of the game. If you're going to follow those metrics and um, that should be with a, you know, the algorithmic formulaic way of, of kind of putting this together, you would think that consistency would be at the forefront since it's, you take a lot of the human equation, you know, that I take it out of the picture and it'd be very interesting to see if how soon uh, division two goes to that metric and that model, because now you have a super region three that we talk about all the time. And you look at teams, uh, Ferris, Grand Valley, Harding, Pitt state, and they're all stuck in this same region. And the latest they can meet is in that regional final. And of course the D two committee, um, they can use the idea and, 
really the excuse of that, well, it's it's the geographic regions and that's just the way it is right now. But uh, since you're not kind of handcuffed or limited to that idea here, in the same sense, I mean, obviously geographic things come to play. It's, it is certainly, it's tough to stomach. Now, uh, kind of the last one for you in the playoffs, the heavy, heavy hitting contests in round two. So after this quote unquote plan, you got Platteville and Wartburg, Susquehanna and Hobart, Johns Hopkins, Grove City, any of those uh, more intriguing than the rest in your mind? Even I, I don't want to leave out Springfield, Mass Dartmouth, the Battle of Ten and O teams. Very fair. Uh, I, 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 that that's number uh, what ten and number fourteen or something yeah. like that. I, I believe going against each other in the MPI rankings. So that that's something else. Uh, but uh, that Johns Hopkins Grove City game does flag itself as uh, you know can't miss uh, scenario. I mean Hobart, Susquehanna. I I. I <laughs> this is the JB uh, hater in me. Uh, I was going to say he's not on the show, so you you could speak freely. I, I, look, I'm thrilled for Hobart because Kevin DeWall is a friend, uh, you know, over the years uh, from things. But this is just, this is a definite jump for them. But look, it's Hobart. You, you, you never count them out. I've learned that uh, it, for what DeWall learned from Mike Craig in the old days. I'm sure uh, the Riverboat Gambler, uh, Mike Craig, was, uh, you know, rubbed off a little bit on Kevin enough that they can win games like these if they stay close uh, late enough. So, That'll be interesting. Uh, Hope Aurora. Uh, I, I, I want to see if I'm right about Aurora being a different team from what I saw in week two when they hosted North Central and really didn't look very good in that game at yeah. any point in time. I, I think they really are. I, I, and I said it that night. I said if that, that game was played in week 10, it would be a much closer, much different game. But because they were so out of sync because they had some new moving parts on that team, Aurora just didn't come out the same way you would have hoped uh, in that game. And speaking of hope, uh, you know, hope 10-0, uh, you know, they, they had to play an MIAA that I think was a little down this year. Alma yeah. was in Alma at, at certain points. But again, you can't tell how good hope is until they play a game like this. So I really do want to see what comes to be in that game. Yeah, we had this chance to have, uh, well, no pun intended, to have Chance Strickland on the show uh, just a few weeks back. That was poor wordplay and not intentional. But uh, we really enjoyed him and, and watching him play, like you said, uh, in a conference that historically has had some solid squads. Albion's been on the down the last couple of years. You lose Dusty to, to Northwood. And then the Alma team that I got to see in person this year in the camp here and played at the Superior Dome that uh, still had some really great pieces offensively. Uh, when you graduate your entire defense, there's going to be some question marks and some holes for that Alma squad and them missing the playoffs. was not on my bingo card at the start of the year, but as you kind of watch them play and, and throughout the conference play, it started to, it started to make sense. So... We'll see. I'm excited. I'm definitely excited. And hopefully that uh, hopeful that we can get on campus and, and cover some of this in person. I really do. Um, but finally, what can we expect from from you and JB for those listening? Maybe aren't familiar with you guys coming on the pipeline. And uh, when it comes to coverage, where can they find it? Well, you know, another new thing is the ESPN Plus uh, situation, and we yes. aren't sure what we're going to be able to exactly show uh, rights-wise. We already had the uh, conversation. The NCAA uh, feels they don't own it sufficient to give us rights to do anything with it, but they're going to put us in touch to see what we can do. But uh, we'll still be covering it in some way, shape, or form. We'll still uh, have shows each week, still have preview shows at least on Fridays. Good and stuff. to the degree we can produce crunch time, we'll do it on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, as usual. This week, maybe not uh, exactly right when we want it because we're still kind of sleep deprived uh, for the last <laughs> few days. But you can find us on Twitter at, at D3FB Huddle or on Facebook at, uh, I believe, D3 Huddle if you're looking for the shortcut to it. But if you type in in the D3FB Huddle, oh, yeah. you will find us there. Uh, as well and uh, it, it, we were also on uh, Instagram JB has uh, got us on there at, at D3FB Huddle as well so you, you can find us on all social media that's our uh, site where we go we are also on Apple Podcasts the audio still goes out there we had some great numbers on uh, just the audio only uh, for awesome. uh, the last week or two so uh, people are interested in this stuff Kobe and I, I just want to say to you You've been doing some phenomenal work out there. I know you've been working to get better and better uh, each season with you, your content and everything, and it's working. Keep up the good work because Appreciate it's that. noticeable. You are in the vernacular out there for sure. For, uh, for you know the players and the coaches, they talk about you all the time when I'm out in the road, and that's to your credit because uh, it's not an easy space to get your name out there for the yeah. right reasons, and you've done that. That means a lot, man. Thank you very much. I know the, of course, with me, you know being 
in the grand scheme of things, especially compared to you guys newer out here. And it took a lot of while for people to get over the name. And once you do that, then it becomes, you know, it becomes a sense of appreciation. It's just getting over that hurdle. So um, I, I do appreciate that a lot. And I'm excited to, to see what I can, you know, pour into this over at least the next, the, this playoff run. And then from there, you know, we'll see. But thank you so much for your time, man. I su- truly do appreciate it. Have a good rest of your night. Thank you.